So, Paul. Yeah? I see here in uh, in the show notes that you've been playing Cave Story. Didn't that come out like a decade ago? Almost. I, I think it was 2016. Oh, okay. I thought I thought Cave Story was like one of the first of the indie games way back. Like when I was working at The Escapist in 2009. I thought it was like that first... Um, Push you know, it, it might be maybe maybe the one I'm playing is like I think it's Cave Story NX and maybe it's like a remaster that was made in 2016. Oh, okay, yeah. So I've seen this come up for years, um, but I never played it. I don't know what it is. What is it? Tell me about Cave Story after all these years. Um, it's a platformer. It's a artsy 2D side scrolling platformer. Explains why I never got around to playing it. That is definitely outside <laughs> my wheelhouse. It's uh, It feels a little bit like Undertale. Like, there are a lot of rabbit ear characters. And so when I was playing it, my kids were like, oh, is this Undertale? I was like, no, this is a different game. And But I can see why they've been confused. Um, it's got story elements. It's got some, like, expanding weapon progression stuff. Um, there's apparently, like the super good ending you have to do this very specific path through the game and like talk to specific people at specific times and stuff but uh it's it, it's all right it's kind of it's kind of uh mario e a little bit a, a little more story than mario um i want to talk about it cuz the the kids were enjoying playing it it's the skill ceiling is is low enough that they can get through the levels without any you know without too much trouble but um then when they get to the boss they're like, oh no, I keep dying, you know. So they would, they'd get to the boss area, and they're like, dad, 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 come and beat the boss for us. And so I go over and you know beat the boss for him, and then uh, go back to playing. <laughs> That's funny. It was a good time. And speaking of old games that are fun and a good time, uh, you've been playing Minecraft recently. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of a cave story, the, the um, <laughs> I've mentioned before that I um that I've been stuck on Minecraft. 1.12 for just years for the better part of a decade i think um just because um there was some break in compatibility with mine you know i don't play vanilla i only play modded minecraft and for whatever right. reason all the really great mods didn't go beyond 112 they, they all kind of got stuck there and so the the mods were kind of thin after that and so i just stayed or at least on the ones that you were interested in Right. And so I just sort of stayed at 112 for just years. And, um, but I, you know, I got the Minecraft itch and I decided, all right, we're, I'm going to go and play some newer mod packs and see what we can do. Hmm. And I played 118 and I just, there was this crazy mod pack that let you dig below zero. Like, you dig down to where nor bedrock is normally, and you can just keep digging, and it goes deeper and deeper, and there's all these crazy rocks and these huge cliffs, and I'm like, this is amazing, and I call Isaac, and I show him to him, and he's like, dude, that's that's vanilla in Minecraft now. That's not a mod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's just, that's just what's, that's the Cliffs and Caves update, so that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> Geodes and all kinds of stuff. Oh my goodness, it is, uh, this is one of my criticisms of Minecraft, is that the caves are always just these little snake tunnels, right? And yeah. it just, it, it seemed like there was so much more that you could do. You could have a giant chamber full of water, a giant chamber full of lava. You could have a small chamber, you could have little pockets, you could have, um, like Terraria has underground, like sort of, a jungle underground doesn't make a lot of sense, but it, you know, <laughs> right. There's luminescent Lost world plants, dinosaurs and stuff. Exactly. You know, luminescent plants and stuff like that. All kinds of interesting stuff you could do that would fit within the Minecraft world, but no, just these boring tunnels. But and now they, I think they have all of that in there. And it really is like, it really is just full of surprises. Like I'll just be digging and I'm like, Oh, weird it's like this um like where you have okay it's a ravine it's a gap between one giant shelf of rock and another but it's at an angle um which happens all the time in the real world you know you'll be like 
between these two massive cliff faces, except they're not like vertical. They're they're at a forty five degree angle. Mm, yeah, and uh, it, it creates this weird claustrophobic feel. Like it's not something's going to fall nothing. over here. Right. This it feels like this giant thing hanging. Which of course, anytime you're in a cave, you've got a whole bunch of rock hanging over your head. But something about having a wide like ribbon <laughs> just sort of a wide open room with a slanted floor like that sort of drives home this feeling like oh weird <laughs> why doesn't the top piece of rock just fall down on the bottom one and why am i between them <laughs> what am i doing here <laughs> this doesn't seem worth it i don't need iron ore that bad <laughs> so yeah i had a great time i didn't get a lot of time to play it but i got to play a little bit of it and i kept wandering around and going this is a cool mod and then discovering no nope, that's just vanilla minecraft these days new monsters new things new formations it's all very cool lots I of new cosmetic game... block options right i like that the game continues to evolve i was worried what would happen to it when microsoft bought it was it just gonna stagnate or are they going to do something stupid or turn it into a shooter? But no, they've continued to evolve it. It stalled there for a few years. I think we were very low mm. on Minecraft updates for the first couple of years. Like, they didn't know what to do with it. But no, they seem to have hit the, you know, they're, they're in the swing of it. And they seem to have their own, like, a distinct artistic vision for what it should be. And the fact that it lines up with my vision is just, you know, icing on the cake. And the, they're still releasing free updates. I mean, that's... That's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, I, think I got a lot most of their I money a... these days is coming from Minecraft Realms where they're renting out servers. Yeah, I paid twenty dollars for Minecraft back in two thousand nine. That is probably <laughs> I will never get more money, more hours out of twenty dollars than that. That is the most <laughs> yeah. entertainment I've ever gotten out of any money. Like Factorio was probably, you know, thirty dollars and but like the the hours I've put in the Minecraft absolutely dwarfs F Factorio. I haven't even hit a thousand hours yet. And Minecraft, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm, you know, several thousand hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. Does it keep track? Man, let's hope it doesn't. It does not. It does not. That would be interesting if it did. But no, it does not. And I've often like wanted to figure it out, but I hop between. You know, I can't even like look at different worlds that I've played because I would hop between mod packs and old worlds would break so i can't even go back mm. to the stuff i was doing like eight years ago like it won't even run yeah. anymore there was a world that i had set up for my kids to they had a, like a land party for one of their birthdays and they wanted to have some features in there and so i ran some scripts on it to modify the world and they would keep going back to it and then eventually they went back to it and minecraft is like uh you know we're not going to support this kind of map like i forget what the the error code was or whatever but it was something like we're not going to support like custom data blocks or something and so like something i had done in the map had, had messed it up and and they're like you you guys are doing some janky stuff here we're we're not gonna have anything to do with it you can't love this map anymore oh i think they did fix it eventually later though like kids went back to it after another month or two and they're like hey we we got it to load again it's like all right cool like i'm glad they figured out what was going on there i certainly don't know that was my favorite time with Minecraft, is playing with my kids. It la it was very short. It took, it, you know, before it got sold to Microsoft, it was actually a huge pain in the ass to get it to work on a LAN. Uh, you had to, like, do IP tunneling or something, or IP forward. I forget what you had to do, but it, it required some special setup. And even mm -hmm. then, it was, like, really fiddly. Um and even once we got we it working, still have it trouble a... getting it working sometimes yeah the, the land support has never been great right but oh i just i loved that you know just playing with my kids on a local server but it also meant mm -hmm. i had to keep it running on my machine all the time once in a while i'd get the they'd be knocking on my door you know Dad, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> minecraft can you turn on the server we want to play yeah my brother hosts a, a server for the kids and so he's like look if you need the server up just send me an email and then, you know, we've got this weekly family dinner. We go over to their house or they come over to our house and, and the kids will be like, hey, you need to get the server running. He's like, no, you can't ask me right now. You have to ask me, like, you have to send me an email so that I get it when I'm sitting at my computer. So, yeah, 
Yeah. Back in the day when, when I start, first started playing Minecraft, it was like my first kid was just born. Like it was my wife and I were playing together. Wow. I remember playing the versions before it was infinite where it was just a fixed mm -hmm. size world and it was just yeah. like dirt and grass and stone in creative yep. mode. And uh, I lost, I mean, my first Minecraft session was several hours long and it was just that stupid like postage stamp world in creative mode. I kind of preferred it when the worlds were that small because you really could like conquer the whole thing. Like you could, you could civilize it. You could have terraformed yeah. it and uh and now it's just it's like it's impossible uh unless you start doing mods or whatever you know sky blocks or something yeah i saw a weird video about this i saw uh apparently there's pay to win minecraft servers out there mm, okay like there's minecraft servers that you that have like loot boxes and they'll give you you know they'll give you items <laughs> that will like let okay. you fly or give you diamond pickaxes or whatever and <laughs> give you and i'm like what and people buy these loot boxes and and i'm like D why would anybody do that why would you go on that server like for the money it costs you know they like to get teleport privileges is like 100 dollars usd and i'm like for 100 us dollars you could just get your own server <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> It's not even a big thing. You can just be god of the server and have all the power. Why on earth would anybody do this? And it's obviously set up to harvest whales. Well, yeah, that and, or they've got some sort of like friend group or something where the cool kid goes on on the server and then he brings all his buddies along and then they've got their mom's credit card or something. Who knows? Right. But the reason I found out about this is, is this channel. I can't remember what it was called, which is just as well. But it was like some teenager, obviously a high schooler, that was, you know, fighting the power. So he was trying to take down these pay-to-win servers to show them, you know. Now show them, you know. We'll teach them not to run pay-to-win servers. He's fighting for the users. <laughs> like, just don't play on the server. What are you doing? But anyway, he talks about spending hours and hours okay his big plan is always build a lag machine like at first it's like mm. this huge redstone repeater thing that just fit you know from bedrock to just below the surface just layer after layer of redstone repeaters that set each other off in a big cycle and um that'll really slow it down and if you hide it underground it takes the mods a while to find it and but he doesn't have creative mode, so he has to harvest the resources to build this manually in survival mode. And like, so wait, <laughs> so he is the virus? Like he's he's implanted himself as the virus that is trying to take over the server somehow? Well, it's not you're just trying to take it down. You just build a lag machine and just bring the server to its knees, and nobody can play. And and, you know, the redstone repeaters. And then they find, you know, he'll spend a week on this. And then, you know, he bring it down for a day. The mods find it. Delete it. There's all your, you know, you spend a week building it. And they delete it in two minutes. And then he's, like, got another one. Ah, I can build one with mine carts where you build a little, mine, a U-shaped mine cart track. Like, um, you know, downhill, flat, uphill again. Just three blocks long. Mm -hmm. And um, you can put an infinite number of minecarts on it. And uh, <laughs> they'll all just roll back and forth forever if you've got one of the things as a powered rail. And that makes a lag machine that's even laggier. And, it uses the, you know, he has all these metrics and he's bringing it down to a tick. The game runs at a tick every five seconds, which is just, like, unplayably <laughs> slow. And, uh, you know... On one hand, I share your distaste for, for pay-to-win servers, but this just seems like such a, you're going to play on the pay-to-win server and invest hundreds of hours so that you can bring the server down for a couple of hours in order to pro. Do the people in charge even know that that's why you're doing it? Isn't it possible you're just doing it for shits and giggles? Like It's, right. like, it's, like, it's like, oh, that's that troll again. Right. It's like... 
protest march, but you don't take any signs or shout any slogans. You just go downtown and march around and get in the way. And everybody's like, what's with the angry mob? I don't know. We got rid of them, but who knows what they were all about. I keep coming back. <laughs> and it was sort of like, I felt bad for this person, but I was also irritated because, like, other people are having fun and you're just, like, <laughs> trying to bring down oh, the well. server. But then well, I felt sorry so for So was he because making he... this video, he's like, come join me in my fight for justice. We'll build a minecart thing together. Oh, no, he wasn't joining me, but he was, you know, showing off what he and there were some other channels that engaged. this was apparent. This is an entire genre of channel that I stumbled into the punishing uh, pay to win server Minecraft channel where you sign on and cause trouble. And they're wow. all sharing tips of like how to build lag machines and how to hide them and all the tricks you can do and, and all so Amazing. and so they you know, they all go by their Minecraft names. So it's like, you know, it it's like Blunt Smoker 69 came up with a new way of uh, building a lag machine that involves armor stands. And you stack something on top of armor stands and it makes the physics glitch out. And, you, you know, you build 100 armor stands. But, you know, you've got to build 100 armor <laughs> stands. Right. Right. Yeah. And all the guys on the server have to do is just, like, make it so you can't place armor stands anymore. Unless you pay right, them 100 exactly. bucks. Right, exactly. It's all just so. It's just such a waste of effort. It's just like, uh, what are you trying to do? Are you, do you think you see yourself as Batman, like saving the world? I don't know. It's just such a weird hobby. That's I, very strange. I mean, I, I do. I did enjoy the theory crafting lag machines. That that's fun to think about. Okay, yeah, well, what's yeah. the minimum effort? You could put it so the the channel was a mix of cringe and fascination for me it's like the very it's like being a very clever person trying to accomplish something very stupid and and, and feeling justified because it seems like the thing that you're fighting is also bad somehow yeah um well thank you speaking of things that are very clever but also very stupid I see you've been playing No Man's Sky. Playing? <laughs> no. I just noticed that they released an update, and so I, I read through the patch notes. Play it. I would, why would I do that? I really, I saw this in the show notes, and I thought you had played. And I thought we were going to share the duties here. I kind of felt like, since you and I both have this affinity for space games and spaceships. And procedural generation. And procedural generation. And yet we both hate this friggin' game. We are sort of obligated to check it out once in a while, but you don't want to check it out too often because it is, as we've already established, an awful game. So what I thought is <laughs> we could just take turns. Like every major update, you could play one, I could play one, and we would just, you know, share the pain. But no. Okay. Here. All right. I, I see. I see how it is. All right. Well, so I'm... I, I got as far as reading the patch notes before my my eyes rolled back in my skull. So here, here's as, this is as much <laughs> right. as I can do. If that's as far as you can get, that's fair. I'll take the next one. <laughs> I was reading through the patch notes and and they've got uh, there's the thing in this in the Steam you know, feed or whatever. It's like, hey, the release came out. It's like, okay, cool. And then it's like, click on the button to go to the patch notes. And so you click on the button, it takes you to their. I would say it's Macromedia Flash, but that's doesn't exist anymore. But whatever you know, web. 10.9 or whatever website they've got with all the moving backgrounds and the animations and stuff and so it goes oh, in there and it like right. pops up the the patch notes right and but it's not just like patch notes it's like patch notes interspaced with with full screen you know, like moving screenshots with like effects on them that move with your cursor i don't even know what i'm glad they got rid of that html bullshit the way it was just so readable and usable and lightweight man I can't wait until the web is just this giant animated monstrosity. But go ahead. Ugh. So I went to I went to their patch notes and I started reading their patch notes slash marketing feed or something. I don't even know what they're trying to do. And uh, one of the first things that jumped out at me was they're like, "Hey, look at this! Like we got our resolution settings so that now you can play with faster frames per second than ever, and it still looks amazing." And so they've got one of those little things where you can they've got like two pictures side by side and you can move the bar back and forth across it, you know, scrub it across to Great. see what it looks like. 
And the first thing is that like it's scrubbed across, but it's not exactly in the same spot. Like it's it's like on subsequent frames or something. And so like everything moves a little bit. And so it, like you're not really comparing apples to apples. You're comparing like they were clearly taken in almost the same spot at almost the same moment. But like I don't I don't know what they did. Like they probably had it like swap the rendering mode and then take another image right immediately or something. But like everything had moved. And it's just if you're developing this game. Can't you even take a screenshot properly? Like, is there no way for you to just stop time as a developer? Right. So that was um that was one of the first things that was crazy. And then I looked at it and I was like, okay, well, what's the deal here? And they're saying, like, oh, you know, it runs at 40 frames a second with this version, and it runs at 70 frames a second with this other version. And like another note, nobody runs a game at 40 frames a second. You run at 30 frames or 60 frames a second. Right. No one runs at 70 frames. It's like, who runs a game at 70 frames a second? Like I could you could run a game at like a hundred and and 14 frames a second or something like once you get up above 60 there are some odd numbers right depending on the refresh rate of your monitor but like right nobody's monitor refreshes at 40 frames a second right that, that's so i don't that's know weird. i don't know what they're trying to do there so so they're like hey you know we can we've got this update now it's the amd fidelity fx super resolution 1.0 that now is able to perform this incredible speed up to date and it's like okay like is it exactly the same it's not exactly the same as it turns out. If you look closely at the images, uh, it looks like the super speed resolution thing that they figured out is to turn off anti-aliasing. Like, that's that's what they did. <laughs> now, I, I I may I may be wrong there. Maybe they've got like special anti-aliasing that anti-aliases the textures, but not like the edges of the geometry or something. It's just I mean I noticed that the edges of the geometry are just you know they're pixelated. And you can see the jackies and. And that's fine, like, I turn off anti-aliasing, but, like, this isn't some sort of crazy new technology. It's just, like, turn the graphic settings down if you want it to run faster. How is this, how is this new? I actually, uh, about anti-aliasing that I think is interesting. I noticed young people hate jaggies. Really bugs them. Like, they hate the shimmering effect, and they're like, oh, you're playing with, an with anti-aliasing turned off. But, like, I grew up in the Doom and Wolfenstein era, where, like, that was just constant just constant mm -hmm. shimmering every frame you get a different set of pixels for every texture yeah. as you approach yeah. a wall it's like random whether or not it's going to have this pixel or not every frame so you you just sort of get used to this continuous shimmer yeah the mosaicing all over the place right and so i don't my favorite is uh when you're running towards a brick wall and it does those oh yeah weird, yeah like lines of because the grout is a different color right and so then the right it's it comes in and out of pattern with the number of pixels on your screen and yeah right it's like it's the opposite of anti-aliasing it's super aliasing <laughs> <laughs> um but i so i that's always the the first thing i turn off is motion blur because why would anybody want motion blur and right. um and uh because it's like so expensive to make you like we're gonna render this gorgeous frame and then make it absolutely illegible because you're turning your head it's like well and why not just and no one's eyes work that way like your eyes have a very right. short exposure time if it's bright out like the only time things get blurry is if you're using a film camera and you've got the f-stop turned way up so that you can Oh, and that's the same thing with depth of field, right? Like if you've got a big old lens, so you can capture a lot of light indoors or whatever, and you've got the f-stop turned way up, then you can get a significant depth of field. But like your eyes don't have a very significant depth of field effect. Like it's it's very small. Right. right. So it's like recreating what it's like if you were running around looking at the world through a camera. <laughs> it's like very <laughs> weird. If you were filming a movie. Right. So the first thing I turn off is motion blur, and the second thing is always anti-aliasing because those mm. are very those are both full screen effects that are very expensive, and one makes don't it turn look off bloom and, though. I mean, like you don't oh, you can't live without bloom, and the, the people that can't live without anti-aliasing hate bloom. They complain that it makes everything blurry, <laughs> and I'm like it doesn't make anything blurry. It makes everything dreamy and wonderful. It, like oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's good times. Oh boy. So so they, they figured out how to turn off anti-aliasing in No Man's Sky. Um they also figured out how to how to let you have six multi-tools instead of three multi-tools. 
um because uh, that's like an advanced technology that is cutting that edge horrible. here that sounds horrible i wonder what it means like <laughs> carry them or maybe it like you leave them back on your ship and you can switch when you're at your ship or what does that mean yeah oh. you probably have to like buy them on the atlas station or something and and then if you want to drop one it just disappears from reality and you have to go buy it again who knows they also figured out how to allow you to rotate objects in when you're building your base because they've got like this whole base building thing system um, so now you can rotate the objects along multiple axes. Whoa! Um, I implemented that in Active Worlds in 1999. <laughs> it's like, it's like, what? Who are who are you trying to impress with these features? Like, what? Why? What? Why? At lunch, at lunch things in active worlds could normally you could only turn them on the y plane you know you could only change which way they're facing mm -hmm. and then we added the ability to turn it you know on the x and z axis too and it was like this amazing thing <laughs> you know there's more breakthrough. lines in your transform matrix than just the the y axis line right right so there are other diagonals times. you can modify yeah, so that was yeah. pretty crazy in the late 90s there. We were getting wild using the whole Matrix. <laughs> I'm glad No Man's Sky finally figured that out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, no one can explain the Matrix. You have to see it for yourself. Um, they also added the ability to, like, they say build your own drone companion, but then, like, in the text immediately below that heading, it's like, you can capture a, a Sentinel drone and, like, repair it and, like, put parts on it and now it's your companion drone and uh this seems right in line with what is their unspoken vision which is to just be destiny right yeah again yeah again just more destiny stuff and it, like that is not when i when i heard what no man's sky was going to be destiny never entered my mind and you know if you're yeah. gonna if you're going to copy destiny I mean, sort of the defining thing of Destiny is the incredibly polished shooting mechanics. And the shooting mechanics in No Man's Sky are utter garbage. They're terrible. You're copying everything but the feature that Destiny is known for. Yeah. Although, to be fair, I, I don't know if this is fair or not, but I mean, a lot of the update stuff about Update 3.8 was that they've entirely revamped the combat system so maybe it's actually tolerable now um i mean you can throw stun grenades so that's got to count for something right weird We're gr stun grenades and i mean can you headshot i mean that was one of the things is that enemies were just no giant bullet weak sponges. spots yeah. Yeah, no weak spots they were just like and there was no strategy to it it was just sort of like point and click and hold the button down until it falls over. Event when you yeah. basically weigh it down with your bullets because it's just <laughs> a giant sponge. Well, see, their inventory gets filled up with bullets, and then they can't use their healing items anymore, and that's why they die. <laughs> it's the whole game. It's you know both sides. It's by playing by the same rules. Uh, yeah, they did add some mechs where you can fight against mechs now and you can like shoot them in the legs and they'll they don't fall over like in mech warrior right where you used to be able to just shoot the mech in the leg and then it'd fall over but uh no it just like gets crippled or something but it's only temporarily crippled because apparently it can heal itself somehow i don't understand i don't understand this game at all or anything wow. about it but um well, so yeah you just, can shoot them in the legs it just sounds like they're trying to make it unsatisfying oh man they didn't have to try they they got that one right out of the gate. Well, speaking of unsatisfying, how about we do some mailbags? All right. All right, so our first question here says, Hey, Seamus and Paul, and it's quite long, so I'm just going to read a few excerpts here. Uh, what are some games that actually treat the death of a character with the respect that it deserves and have it serve as more than a mere plot device? Uh, and give some examples. You can read this in the, in the post. Um, what other games have served as good examples of relationships? Very rarely. Okay, so there's kind of two questions here. So what games treat death well and, and handle it well instead of just using it as a plot point or a, like a, a twist? Um, 
I know I keep coming back to this game, but The Walking Dead season one, the character that dies is the main character. The 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 first season is the story of Lee. And no matter what you do, um, Lee dies. All you do is decide, you know, how he died, what he does before he and goes. Why. And why. Right. Yeah. And you don't know that starting it out. You know, you, you're fighting to survive the whole time and then... Uh, and then at the end, you just, you, you, at the start of the final chapter, you realize you've been bitten and you just, you got to come, you, you have to come to terms with, okay, is my character going to die or am I playing through this special character that's going to find a way to cheat death? Um, and I thought this was a fascinating thing. It lets you, you know, you're bit on the arm and it, it lets you cut off your arm and you think maybe that'll mm. save me. Maybe that'll save me. And it doesn't. You're you're infected. And mm. But I kind of like that because it you know you're the main character. And so you think, you know, maybe <laughs> I'm going to make it. Which is the kind of thing that, you know, just normal people think, well, maybe maybe it'll be different for me. And you know, that's the first step of, of grieving is denial. Maybe this won't happen to me. Maybe this and, isn't happening to me right now. Right. And I thought that was just so brilliant i thought it was a fascinating um choice and i decided um when i played through my concern was for clementine you, you have this little girl you're taking care of and my rationale was i might need this arm to protect clementine if i've got one arm chopped off i'm gonna be pretty useless I, i'm still mm. in good health now i want to be I want to be there for Clementine. I can always just off myself when I start to like really turn. Mm. Mm. I, I found that in time and that was a choice I made and I felt it and it really hit me. And that was like one of the most powerful moments in gaming for me. That was just an incredibly affecting moment is making that choice and coming to terms with you're going to die. And you didn't know that at the outset, this isn't like, you know, at the beginning of the game, Oh, I'm playing through this story of a character who's going to die. Nobody knew that. And you play through the first chapters thinking, you know, you're just going to be another survivor. And so, in fact, that I, I, I feel bad I picked on this example first because I think this is the best that's ever been done. <laughs> there have been a lot of good deaths in video gaming, but none of them hit me as hard as, as the death of Lee. Mm -hmm. um, what other deaths... It's easier to think of deaths that are not affecting. I just have this whole catalog. I remember the death of Johnny <laughs> Gat's girlfriend in Saints Row 2. Um, the bad guys come in and murder her and slow music plays and it shows flowers falling to the floor in slow motion while this somber music plays and Johnny Gat's like, no! And I howled with laughter through the whole thing. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> oh, this is so stupid. And who cares? You monster. <clears throat> oh, no, not what's her name? <laughs> no, they got what's her name? You bastards. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like, uh, what was it? Hyperlight Drifter. Like it was the whole game was kind of about um, being mortally wounded or something like that. The main character is always coughing up blood, like even when things are going well. And there's just like this, there's this sense that like the character is is very mortal, right? It's not like the superhero is going to like plow through anything. It's just like, how far can you get with this guy? Like, how far is this guy going to be able to get? And um, so like every time that character died, it was always just kind of like, oh, man, like, did it have to be now? It wasn't like, oh, I was robbed. It was just like, oh, but but couldn't couldn't he have gotten a little bit further? And uh, I don't know. It it never it never wrote, really wore off for me. And I was I was really impressed by the ability to to give every time because it's a it's like a uh, shmup or something like it's, you know action game. And so your character not infrequently dies, but like every time it just felt like, oh man, like he he should have been able to get further and like. It, it's it's a really sad thing that that this had to be the end, you know, at that for yeah. that run through. I don't know what it was about it. It's, it's something about the the character just always felt very mortal. You know, I just I'm trying to think of good ones, and I keep thinking of bad ones. 
on years of training. The death of Thane did not work to, for me in Mass Effect 3 because he was killed by Kai Lang. <laughs> but what about some kid? I forgot about that one. <laughs> oh no, not some kid. <laughs> Doesn't make it in your top 10 list. Right. Well, even the whole earth getting slagged didn't didn't really affect me in the like what if, oh no, the earth is all the earth is just like this glowing magma now that reapers have kicked its ass so hard you can see like the surface is melted. But we're still trying to save it and I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Wait, what? Whatever. I didn't yeah. I don't remember that part. Yeah, yeah. I never like, played the you, game, but when you're So well, So hang on. Like, so take back Earth was like take back this molten ball of magma oh you know there were parts of it that weren't like okay i guess the, the there were parts of there. it that weren't completely incandescent <laughs> right the part the point is their their view of earth was not representative of what actually happened to earth their artists went too far in depicting the earth well we want to show that the earth is really damaged so we're going to make it like glowing like incandescent and it's like but <laughs> then you get down and it's just all the buildings have fallen over right so oh so it's, what how right that's not right, how well, the, incandescence works the black body radiation must work differently in the mass effect universe because that is not how that works right what actually happened to earth is that the Reapers went down and physically stomped on all the buildings. Wow. You know, like, imagine if you and I, like, we get out to the greens at St. Andrews and we're like, this grass has got to go. And so we just get out there in our cleats and we start stomping the cra crap out of the grass. Take that grass. Ah. You know, how we'd be at it for a while. It would take a while to um, really kill all the grass. You know, that, that that never works for me. I think that's called aerating, actually. It makes the grass grow better. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, this is the best the tools the Reapers have is knock down the buildings. I, I Trust me, they were not aerating the earth and making people grow better. It was making a mess of things. <laughs> it, was just, it was just not the most efficient. Like, this is the best you could do, Reapers, if I wanted to kill all the people on Earth. We have nukes! How do you not have nukes <laughs> if you just want to kill it? Well, if you want to harvest everybody, then why are you killing everybody? And if you just want to kill everybody, right. why don't you nuke everybody? And why am I ranting about Mass Effect 3 again? Oh, this is oh, crap. No. Okay, move forward. All right, the next question is, um, what about relationships? Uh, what games have included good examples of relationships? We very rarely see marriage, children, parental friendly relationships that feel complicated enough to be real. Lee and Clementine. Um, Garrus from Mass Effect would probably be an easy example of a well-written friend. No, you've doomed us all, Chris. Why? Thanks, Chris Gatsu. Thank you, Chris. Lee and Clementine. I realize I already used that one for the best death and also the best relationship, but there it is. Lee and Clementine. Best supporting actor. Powerful. Yeah. Best boy. Best gaffer. Key grip. Um, yeah, I, it just, it's so good. It's so good. I love those characters. I <laughs> still love those characters all these years later. There's so few that rise to that level that affect you that much um i feel like alex from half-life uh half-life 2 oh and eli if you if you want to go for death of characters uh eli vance okay that one really got mm -hmm. me yeah you didn't see it yeah. come. there's another one that you just did not see coming that was just right. such a, a brilliantly executed it faked you out it thought that you thought they were going to kill alex and instead they kill eli and it just Oh, oh, it was so good. Death of Dr. Breen, I think, is interesting. Death of a villain. I don't know that I feel sorry for him, but I often puzzle over Dr. Breen and what an interesting mm. guy he is. Yeah, complex characters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I keep trying to reference, like, um, Bioware games. But I don't know if it's because I feel Bioware has turned on me or if I've outgrown Bioware games. But, like, I, I know that Bioware would show up in this list. If you'd asked me these questions 10 years ago, I would have had some answers from Bioware games. And now I don't. And maybe it's just, like, I've seen the magic trick or maybe I've just, like, gone off their games. Or maybe I've just played better stuff that's made it look worse by comparison. But 
yeah, Bioware doesn't make the list anymore, and it would have at one time. Mm. You don't feel like uh, Hero from Fable 3 makes a list for, like, relationships? <laughs> Deep, lasting, meaningful relationships? Oh, yeah, the, the, um, my wife in Skyrim, where I walked up to a random peasant on the street and asked her to marry me, and she agreed, and we married, and then she sat around the house and, you know, occasionally gave me a health potion when I came back. Man, <laughs> that was a relationship. Yeah, as Chris says, very rarely. It's hard. I'll admit it's really hard. Mm. Yeah, it, in the same way that making realistic looking and moving human characters is like the hardest thing in graphics um making realistic acting human characters is one of the hardest things in ai and even storytelling right like writing convincing characters is not trivial it's it's one of the hardest things to oh, do oh no, it's hard all right next one all right here we go from humphrey westwood no introduction no sign off it just says thoughts on japanese spider-man question mark how does he compare to the original? And there's a YouTube link. utu.be slash l-f-y-i-r-z-o-y-a-v-w. The end. No sign off. Okay. Um, so you can watch through this. I watched part of it. And it is sure a thing. This is, this is the one from like the 70s, right? They haven't made another one, have they? I think so, yeah. It certainly feels like Japanese nonsense from the 70s. Okay, yeah. Okay, I remember this from back in the day. I caught wind of this. I don't... I saw it on cable at somewhere, you know, went over to a friend's house, they had cable, and they, I got to see Japanese Spider-Man. And I realize it's a bit of a meme now. Haha, <laughs> look at this crazy version of Spider-Man. Um, at the time, well, for one, I was a kid, and I was angry. I was so angry that they got Je that they got Spider-Man so wrong. That's not how Spider-Man. That's not. That's not how Spider-Man works. That's not what it's. He doesn't have a helicopter or whatever his ridiculous thing was. He can't fly. <laughs> he, they've got all his powers wrong. They've done everything wrong. The this makes no sense. And you know, I thought they were trying to. Re you know, I I didn't understand that they were trying this to. This is a you know, foreign adaptation right and that on a shoestring budget nothing. right spider-man meant nothing to them this was just like you know somebody over here sees cowboy bebop and go oh that's cool we should make something kind of like that well i mean it's and, every samurai that shows up in western media right like right oh samurai those are cool let's put that in the movie and then, like, someone from, from Japan watches it, and they're like, oh, they got samurais all wrong. Oh, what are they doing? Right. But I didn't understand any of that. You know, I was a kid, and I just, you know, I was very protective of because Spider-Man was my favorite superhero. Like, it was the only superhero I even cared about. Right, um, right. He's your neighborhood Spider-Man. He's everybody's friend. Right. It was like, okay, my hero is, like, Mr. Rogers and then Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> like... It was just so important to me, and I was just so irritated. But, of course, I had to watch it because I was just hungry for as much Spider-Man media as I could get. Here's a funny story. <laughs> Even rip-off Spider-Man was good enough, huh? Funny story. I had drum lessons when I was a youngster. And, um, you know, I came from a musical family. My mom's side of the family. Lots of musicians over there. And, you know, mom was like, okay, it's time for you to choose your instrument. What are you going to be? And I was like, I want to be a drummer. And she was like, oh, okay. I'm a little bit disappointed. Like, I'm sure you could pick up drumming after you learn a real musical instrument. But, all right, you choose drumming. But I was real little and not ready for that level of maturity and discipline. I mean, I was like six. Oh, no. And drum practice was on the same night as Spider-Man. And I didn't want to go. <gasps> oh, no. I, I, I just want to watch Spider-Man. The only show I care about. And it's on. It's it, why, why is this on? Why do people schedule things on Spider-Man night? Why would anybody schedule anything? Like, I'm going to miss it. And this guy <laughs> teaching me how to play drums. He's also going to miss Spider-Man. And you're taking me there. So you're going to miss Spider-Man. We're all missing Spider-Man. <laughs> 
Oh man! And before before they had everything uploaded as a VOD to YouTube, right? You couldn't see that stuff later, right? Oh yeah, it was gone. It was just gone forever, as far as I knew. Oh no, they they would show the episodes later. You know, they would do reruns in the summer, also on the same night of the week when I'd have drum practice. <laughs> And so that's why I never became a musician. <laughs> well, I know um, there may be other reasons, who knows, but... Th there may be other reasons. I was not mature enough for it. I think it would have been a great thing for me to do about three or four years later, when I had a few more years of development under my belt. It would have been a wonderful You're like thing 18. for me to learn. <laughs> it was too late by then. But, uh, like... You know, six was much too... Some kids are ready at six. Some kids are ready before six. I was not ready to learn anything structured before, before like, ten. But at ten years old, it, it totally, I should have learned piano at ten years old. That's what I should have done. But mm -hmm. by then, you know, there was too much going on in my life, and nobody had time to take anybody else to piano lessons. If you'd like to learn more about Seamus's sad childhood... Yeah, then you can read his book, uh, How I Learned by Seamus Young. It's available in paperback on Amazon and uh, Goodreads, I think. Yeah, I changed the title. It's How I Missed Spider-Man every Wednesday. <laughs> um, we have a uh, mail here on Detention Video Game, and I have not played it. I am aware of it. I believe if this is the video game I'm thinking of, it's one that is critical of China. But then I see it starts off with, have you watched the movie Dis Detention? Um, but I, I can't comment on it. I, I'm going to assume you haven't played it. Yeah, I've, I've neither played the game nor watched the movie. I'm not really into horror because my kids can't uh, be around when I'm doing horror stuff. And that's all the time. Right. Okay, so I'll just shelve that one. Sorry, Jolt. And I have, uh, I mean, that's the real horror for me is totalitarianism. <laughs> <laughs> like Silent Hill, I enjoy oh, I I enjoy the horror of Silent Hill. You know, psychological, some sort of being haunted by some inner demon or your past or sucked into some doomed purgatory of torment and fear. I'm into that. But you throw me into a game where it's like, you know, jackboot thugs beat people up in the street or everybody's afraid to speak out. And I can't handle it. I can't handle it unless the gameplay involves you smashing that. But just a game where you have to exist in that reality. I couldn't finish Papers, Please. And I was actually oh, pretty man. gentle. I I just, like, freak out. I just... Ugh. So, um, yeah. No comment on real world events, please. Right. But I, I just... I can't... I can't handle it. All right. Well, here's one short. Dear Diecast... I was going through the archives and found Seamus's top 64 games, and he mentions that Tetris was not for sale on Steam in any way, shape, or form, although as of writing, I assume. I did a quick search just now and found that you can buy Tetris on Steam, including anime Tetris. So, the question is, what anime-ified game would you like to see? Call of Duty Modern Warfare Anime Edition? Anime Lord of the Rings? With kind regards, Chris. Wow, what a twist, Chris. Thank you. Wow, that's an interesting question. You know, anime Lord of the Rings would get on my nerves. I'm very protective of Lord of the Rings, and yeah, I, that wouldn't work because it would it would certainly have a different soul. It would have a different focus. Um, because like Lord of the Rings is very personal. <laughs> the, the its view on power and how there's a lot religious going on there. There's a lot of philosophical and moral responsibility and, and right. the, yeah, the role of power in government and in interpersonal relationships, all of that stuff. It's very, yeah, it has a unique voice also in fantasy. There aren't many fantasy works or, or settings that have that particular angle. And it would be completely unreasonable to expect a Japanese creator to match that. Of course, they, they've got different culture, different attitudes. In fact, that would be the whole point of them doing the adaptation is to do their own thing with it. But I would just like, oh, but that disagrees with the philosophy of the of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the Japanese Spider-Man all over again. Right? <laughs> and Boromir's so... just like running around shouting, Nani! 
But I love this idea for almost any other genre, anything else. Take any other mm-hmm. game and and animeify it. Like I'd love to see the Japanese take on any big block, but like uh, Ubisoft games, especially just because they're so vapid. Uh, you know, you could just imagine. Okay, Ubisoft games are so thin on thematic material that they almost act as a prompt. Write a story about, you know, but without specifics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you could just use that and make your own thing on top of it. And it'll probably be much better than whatever Ubisoft made. So that'd be great. <gasps> you, oh my goodness, the obvious one, Tomb Raider. There you go. Big tits anime. Go for it. <laughs> oh, please don't give her giant tits. I won't be able to handle it if if I'm supposed to believe that she's like a hardcore rock climber and she's got these giant bosoms in the way all the time. And and she's like also some sort of like actress or something or what was it? it right. It, Tomb Raider 2. She was actually literally a pole dancer or something. Right. Oh yeah, they would probably make her a pop star in in Japanese Tomb Raider. She'd be like a pop star that moonlights as a Tomb Raider. And there's just like the every other episode is a concert that they're throwing. Yes, there'd be which of course would be would be gameplay. The rhythm game. Yeah, it'd be a little mini game of like some guitar hero y type thing. I could see like um what 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 was the guy the the douchebag with the iconic ball cap? Oh, uh Aiden Pierce, uh Watch Dogs. That's the Ubisoft game. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I could totally see Watch Dogs as, like, one of those anime that is only just, like, a guy walking into a bar and, like, having this long philosophical conversation with the bartender, and the bartender's, like, cleaning glasses, and you've just got all these beautiful shots of, like, glass and, like, out the window with the birds in the park and, you know, right. that kind of an anime. That would be that would be amazing. I'd love to see it reimagined that way, because, I mean, like, anything's better than the way it turned out. <laughs> right. Right. Or if they were to do it and they were to keep his act, the story would realize that Aiden Pierce is a reprehens re reprehensible asshole. And everybody would point that out to him in the story. <laughs> and the story would, like, really be against him. And we'd be, be watching his downfall, watching him be punished for being such a dipshit. Like a heart of darkness kind of thing? Yeah. So I love this idea um, of animating the five things. Anime Factorio? Weird. What would that even be like? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I'd be interested to find out. Anime Minecraft is kind of already a thing. Like, my kids, when they put skins on their Steve, they make the eyes, you know, most of the face, and it, it doesn't have a mouth, and it looks like a big bobblehead chibi anime character. So, like, okay, that's done. There we go. All that's left is Anime No Man's Sky. You know, like one of those, like a mech, like a mech in space kind of anime thing. That'd be, actually, that'd be pretty good. That'd be pretty rad. Macross. Yes. Oh, man. You know, I watched the Macross saga as a kid, but we didn't know it was called the Macross saga. We called it Robotech. <laughs> I mean, the books were called Robotech, so. Right. But they were called Robotech over here. And... They were, no kidding, the most successful, the most sophisticated cartoons that were on. Because, you know, this was still like mid-80s. We were still dealing with a lot of stuff was leftover garbage from the 70s. You know, barely mm -hmm. animated, terrible, ugly, repetitive, you know, Scooby-Doo. Barely yeah, animated. Yeah, your Scooby-Doo's, your He-Man's. Um... Your Bugs Bunny and Looney Tunes stuff. No, okay, Bugs Bunny and Looney Tunes is wonderful, but like they, you know, there was only so much of that. Like it was, you'd seen, yeah. by the time you were six years old, you'd seen every Bugs Bunny 10 times. <laughs> right? But they didn't make, they didn't make new Bugs Bunnies every week. Yeah. Oh, here's the opera one again. But, you know, Robotech had some sophisticated themes. No, I mean, it's childish. If you're an adult, it'll come off as childish today. But it was more sophisticated than anything else that was on in terms of themes and story and what it was about and uh, blew my mind and kind of changed what I Even thought. Even better than G.I. Joe? That's hard to imagine. Right. Like, it made, 
Like, I thought G.I. Joe was cool, and then I'd see Robotech, and then I'd be sort of embarrassed by G.I. Joe and just right. how empty it was. Yeah. And uh, it was weird. Like, it felt like, I can't believe this is on TV. Like, in G.I. Joe, because parents' groups were so overbearing, like, nobody could die. So you'd have this huge battle and, like, all these planes getting shot down, like, boom, all these jets <laughs> explode. And then a few seconds later, these parachutes just sort of materialize and bad guys parachute down. And then we cut away. Like, yes, they're still alive. Don't worry. Nobody died in this horrible. <laughs> We're fighting this giant battle in which absolutely nobody dies. Right. Somehow the entire we, we completely failed in our entire purpose on both sides we're all so incompetent that we can't manage to kill people in a war <laughs> right these these like super militaries that are like the concentrated super secret forces can't kill each other they are either so good or so incompetent that they cannot kill each other but meanwhile in robotech like people would friggin die it would just be like, oh, a building collapses, and you know there was people in it. Or, or you know, this would be a Yeah, well, and they're, like, is... pulling bodies out in their body bags, and it's just like, wow, like, this is real. There was a scene at one of them where, like, the hero comes, and there's a woman that's naked, and it doesn't show her, but, you know, it, like, shows her naked back. Holy cow, a naked back! What the heck is going on in this Cartoon Man show? <laughs> this is scandalous i hope my mom doesn't come into the room because that's exactly what your mom comes into the room <laughs> what are you what this is on tv during the day <laughs> what's this country coming to right exactly but uh oh, it was just it was so good i loved it so much robotech there we go Macross. no man's sky just needs to turn into macross you just need to redo the whole thing Make it uh, all missiles and flying mechs and collapsing buildings and, and people with naked backs, I guess. Do you want to, you know how off the hook uh, Robotech was? They had one of the characters on the team, like the third saga or whatever. One of the guys on the team was named Lancer. Okay. And he was just, you know, regular fighting dude, very lean, kind of androgynous looking, but he would dress up as Yellow Dancer who looked like a chick. And one of the jokes was they would meet people, like they'd meet some slimy guy, they would be drooling over a picture of Yellow Dancer. Like, oh, you guys know her? Oh, I'd like to meet her. And <laughs> wink, wink. You know, exactly. But meanwhile, I'm like, you know, thinking back, I'm like, holy cow, is that trans character? Or, or. At, I mean, it's cross-dressing at the very least, right? At the very least, it's somebody in drag possibly dealing because Lancer was so androgynous. This was possibly a trans character in the eighties that went completely under the radar and nobody noticed. Nobody made a big deal of it. Blew my mind. Turned into his own, uh, his own trope, right? I mean, like the Lancer is like a trope now. Is it? I did not know that. All right. Well, you're welcome. All you people that are stuck on, they are stuck on TV tropes now for another week. I didn't know about this. I um, I th I thought Robotech was like this secret thing that only old timers like me remembered, because like it went off TV, you know, by the end of the '80s. So I wasn't even sure if millennials had heard of it. I'll be honest, I I never watched the anime, but I did read several of the novels, the fiction novels. I'm afraid to go back to it today, because it it might not be good. It may have not aged well. It might not age well, but who knows? All right. We've definitely done a show. In fact, we've done a show and we gave him a little bit of extra this week. All right. Isaac, just cut out all the boring parts and it'll you know, come down to an hour. No, if you cut out all the boring parts, it'll be 10 minutes long. Keep <laughs> just enough of the boring parts to fill us out to our requisite hour, Isaac. All right. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamesyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. See you later.